All right. Hello, everyone. I am Eric, co-host of Reconsider. Um, sorry about the delay. Apparently, the whole the whole uh, conference is running a little bit behind, but we will not be running behind. We are starting right now. So I'm just going to go ahead, share screen, get started. Um, you guys know the you guys know the drill at this point. Um, questions in the ask a question button at the bottom, and um, you know we'll be Sam. Uh, Sam will be helping me. Uh, with those questions at the end, um, and I'll be answering as many of them as I can. I'm going to try to get through this as fast as possible because I think there's a great conversation to be had. Um, uh, obviously, uh, I ended up changing my my topic here um, because I got I I got really fired up. And and those of you who know my work, I'm normally a much more um, much more like detached kind of like hey everyone, there's a there's a new way of looking at this here. Um, but when I when I saw, um, you know, George Floyd being killed and and crying for his mother, I got really fired up, and um, so I so Xander and I have done a ton of research into people who are who are actual experts on policing and race in the United States, and I want to share a little bit of what we can actually do about what we're seeing in America right now, such as uh, the police attacking peaceful protesters, um, the police attacking the press with. Um, this is this is kind of like weaponized long range pepper spray, right? So it's not a self defense mechanism. It is an attack or crowd control mechanism. Um, you can see the press right there is being blasted. Um, here's a member of NBC News that got hit with a tear gas grenade in the head um, and had to retreat. Um, you guys probably all saw this. This was the, this was like the beginning of of this like landslide of of police brutality. Um, and, and excessive use of, of force and other just bad behavior. Um, this reporter for CNN was arrested on camera. Um, the whole conversation was was captured. He was not told what he's being arrested for. Um, you know, the police were like, hey, we need you to move. And they said, sure, tell us where to go. Just arrested him. Didn't read him his Miranda rights. Didn't tell him what he's being arrested for. Um, and so, and so the, you know, there was an Onion article um, sorry, there was a sorry. There was an article I saw in Reddit's not the Onion, which was um, uh, police. You know, uh, widespread police brutality against peaceful protesters protesting police brutality. Um, and so we realized, and and so I think a lot of the public realized the pervasiveness of this problem. And of course, in the United States of the last ten years, and and reconsider, we've been talking about it since twenty fourteen. American division, often arbitrary division, cultural division, tribal division, gets in the way of us being able to solve problems. Um, and so we've studied this for a long time. Those of you who've read Wedge are familiar with this. Pew does some great research on um, the values and ideologies of Democrats and Republicans back in 94. Lots of overlap. You saw you had liberal Republicans, conservative Democrats, which I, which like you look at now, you're like, what? And um, you know, and, and their ideological divide was quite close. And now the Democrats have moved left and the Republicans have moved right. Um, those of you who have ever had the thought in your mind of it's like, oh, uh, my party hasn't moved direction. It's the other party that's moved direction. Um, it's been both parties that have, have moved directionally. Now, you know, there's more to our, much more to our division than ideology. Um, you know, in Wedge, we talk about it, reconsider, we talk about it. We think that the bigger problem rather than ideology is this like tribal divide where, where people root for their side no matter what um, and take their side stance no matter what because of the colors on the jersey more than the ideology. But the division in the United States is so deep that we actually have totally different views of reality now. The, the, just the most prescient example right now is um, it's about the coronavirus outbreak. So this yellow line is the worst is still to come, April through June. The purple line is the worst is behind us. Well, Democrats, still the vast majority, believe the worst is yet to come. Republicans, a, the substantial majority, believe the worst is behind us. We've we're looking at you know we're looking at the same thing unfolding around us right now. And depending on what party you're part of, you have a totally different understanding of reality around something that is very personally prescient to us. This isn't a far off problem, right? This isn't an abstract problem. This is something that affects our health and how we, what we believe about what it's gonna be like in the future 
is going to influence how we act. Like this, this is the kind of thing you'd expect people to all be very rational about. But we have totally different views of reality. And part of that is because we don't even watch the same news anymore. Now, that's been true for a long time. If you're conservative, Fox News, Hannity Radio, Limbaugh, and then ABC, CBS fall behind that. So this is where they're getting most of their news. If you're consistent liberal, it's CNN, The New York Times, PBS, NPR, NBC. You can see there's pretty much no overlap there. Um, Democrats or liberals always have a more diverse set of, of new you know, places that they get their news from. Um, at some point, the moderates kind of all take over, moderate liberals, moderate conservatives take over, and, and they get a lot of their news from these shared ABC, NBC, CBS sources. Um, but if you're on the ideological divides, you're getting totally different news sets. So you don't even really know what the other side is reading um, and, and, and how they're seeing it. Um, social media, of course, exacerbates this even further because it's designed to bubble. Uh, again, we talk about this in Wedge and on the podcast pretty frequently. And so how do we possibly overcome this, right? And those of you who have, who have attended my talks in the past, I often talk about some form of it pays to polarize. And so why does this happen? And I'm usually pretty bleak about it. I say, I don't know what to do. Um, my biggest fear was that in response to George Floyd and the protests, we would just have deeper division than ever. Um, and I was surprised at what I started to see. So here's a New York Times article. And by the way, I'll, I'll make the slide deck public. There are links to, to everything here. Um, I was very surprised to see this. This is the net support for Black Lives Matter, just the, the, the movement as a whole and all the baggage that comes with it. Um, and the, you know, over time we've been trending from, you know, net underwater to net above water. So net number is support minus opposition, right? So if you have plus 10, right, it might be 55 over 45. Um, George Floyd was killed here at this point. Um, I hope you can see my mouse. George Floyd was killed, you know, kind of right at the end of that last dip. Um, and then, you know, there's this slope and what people started to see over that next week uh, was police brutality against the press, against protesters, more black uh, men typically being killed and and stories of of black Americans and, uh, and non-black Americans, right? Americans of other colors having been killed by the police in, in ways that that seem heinous to us being brought back in the fore. And so we had this kind of spike. And um, this New York Times article goes through all sorts of other issues from gay marriage to trans, you know, how people feel about like transgender Americans and their rights, um, marijuana and drugs, all sorts of other stuff. This has never happened before. This has never, ever happened before. We went from about plus 10 to nearly plus 30. And it, I believe it's continuing to climb. That's the, that's the early indicator. Um, that's a sea change, right? And maybe it might backslide a little bit, but like, you know, like the stock market, you have some dips, but that's a sea change, right? And there were a lot of people for a long time. I mean, if you go read Wedged, rewrote Wedged when Black Lives Matter was deeply underwater. Most black Americans in 2014 opposed the terms Black Lives Matter. They preferred All Lives Matter by a small, a small plurality. Um, that's totally different now. We're looking at a different world than we were six years ago. We're looking at a different world than we were a month ago. The support for protests is just outrageously massive. You don't see this kind of unity among Americans for anything, um, not since attacking Afghanistan in response to 9-11. Um, it was higher, it was like 90 some on. Um, but look, a majority of Republicans support these protests. So if you go deeper in this Forbes article, it was, are the, protest, are the protesters justified? Um, and so the pro they believe the protesters are justified. And this number actually went up. Um, there are were, there were older, so this was uh, the 9th of June. There are older polls where, uh, you know, it was like 30 some odd percent of Republicans, but this support has gone up over time, um, in part because Republicans are exposed to how the police are suppressing, are, are you know, continuing to be violent. It's not just this one incident. It's not just George Floyd. Excuse me, um, George Floyd. George Floyd was was the you know the spark in the powder keg, um, and as Americans have watched it burn, they become increasingly supportive of their fellow Americans who are protesting against police brutality. 
And even NASCAR, which is, you know, I remember someone saying, boy, I didn't expect that on my, you know, I didn't have that on my 2020 bingo card. Um, NASCAR banned the Confederate flag and rallied around um, their one black American driver, Bubba Wallace, um, when they found a noose in his garage. And I know there's a little controversy over whether it was a noose, done the research, saw the pictures, definitely noose. Um, and apparently just someone tied it back in October when someone else was in the garage, some white guy was in the garage. Um, it happened to be around, but um, but NASCAR responded with this great show of support for Bubba. And, um, you know, and of course, uh, put their foot down that this kind of behavior in, in a predominantly Southern white conservative sport, probably the most Southern white conservative sport um, in America is unacceptable. There is a sea change occurring in the United States right now. You know, statues being torn down, Aunt Jemima's out the window, I mean, all sorts of stuff. Um, and even Congress is trying to do some stuff about police, but we're going to talk about what you can do about it. But the biggest problem is that divisions remain. And, you know, as we talked about in Pays to Polarize, as we talked about in Wedged, there is there are financial and political interests in continuing to divide the American people. And so you're being blasted right now with all sorts of stuff to try to cause greater division on these issues that are related but peripheral to the issue of police brutality and in particular um, you know, the American government and, and police's relationship with black American citizens. Um, so there is risk of division arising over which statues are being torn down, right? The Confederate statues, people starting to grumble, but you know, when, when you start to see, um, Teddy Roosevelt being attacked, right? There is a risk of Americans being divided over that. And you're going to see media push this on you. You're going to see politicians push this on you. Of course, you know, depending on what media you were looking at, um, there were very, very different conversations happening about the looting that occurred during these protests, right? Either we need to not talk about it, right? It's, it's let's, let's make sure that we don't bring it up or, you know, hey, this is front and center. This is what's going on. Our cities are burning. We have to dominate the streets, right? And, and there is risk of division being pressed in to re-wedge us into these different camps. There is a chance that we lose this unity. And so how do we, oh, excuse me. And there's, there's, um, and so we need to talk about how do we, how do we fight that? How do we take the momentum that we have and cause even greater unity in America about taking action on something that the three quarters of Americans at least agree on. Um, one of the challenges to achieving unity here is that, you know, I've seen, I've seen this article and others make the rounds. This is Wall Street Journal. It's a well-respected newspaper. We're not talking about Infowars here, um, where there are people that say, well, you know, maybe it's actually not a black American's problem. Maybe it's an all American's problem, right? Police brutality. Um, and, and I'm not gonna, I, like, I'm, you know, i I could cite some research, um, but I'm not, I'm not gonna try to make the case one way or another. Um, I obviously have my own opinions about it, but um, but this could drive a wedge too. And I've seen people who are otherwise outraged over how George Floyd has been treated, or sorry, how George Floyd was killed um, and how protesters have been treated and how the press have been treated, bring this up to say, you know, I know you're saying it's all about race, but it's not all about race. And like, it's a totally unnecessary argument to have, but one that we could spend our time on, we could spend our time arguing about this. Um, and that risks wedging us further as well. Um, and so how do we overcome these kinds of problems? Um, well, some of it is focusing on what are our deepest values. So this is something we talked about in Wedge. What, what do we really care about? And so one option for, you know, the kind of folks who kind of like bring around, you know, if, again, if you're saying, hey, this is really important to me, I want to solve police brutality, I, I want to support my, you know, fellow black citizens, um, and, and someone says, well, you know, I'm not sure what the systemic, you know, I've, I've seen this article, maybe it's not really systemic racism. What do we do? We can lean back on our civil rights as Americans, right? And I don't even, I, I, this felt unnecessary, but, um, but Americans have this like outrageously widespread agreement that free speech and free press are essential, uh, that the, the government should not interfere with the freedom of the press, that, that, 
uh, the right to due process in the enshrined in the Fifth Amendment is essential or very important. Um, it's it's just like bone, you know, it's just brain dead easy to get people to agree that Americans have these civil rights, that they are enshrined, that they are important. And if they are under attack, you will get everyone fired up about it, no matter where they are in the political spectrum. And so what if we look back at some of these images and we say, well, look, the the freedom of the press is under attack, right? Like, what if this was a picture from China or Russia or Iran, right? Just change, you know, change a few of the details here. And we looked at that and we'd say, boy, you know, Iran, man, you know, they they send their police out to shoot the press, right? Make sure that, uh, I mean, they may not even have, they, I mean, they don't even have a press to, a free press to suppress. Um, but if they did, uh, you know, there, there, there are other places you could imagine um, Russia actually being one of them. They have an ostensibly free press. Um, but hey, when, when uh, you know, when they say something that, that the state doesn't like, they fall out of windows. Oops. Right. Is that the country we want to be? Um, you know, Iran, uh, this is a better case of Iran, China, um, you know, the Hong Kong protests, protests in Russia, people just standing there peacefully assembling. Look, is anyone throwing anything? Is anything on fire? No, but we're blasting people with water cannons. Um, you can see the guys in yellow, they're running forward with um, pepper spray just to make sure they hurt these people who are just standing there. Um, their right to assembly is under attack by the state. Um, a reporter who was arrested, the right to, you know, the, the press is under attack by the state. Um, and his Fifth Amendment rights are being violated because the Miranda rights um, were enshrined as part of the Fifth Amendment. He's not being told why he's being arrested. Um, he was not read his Miranda rights, at least not on camera. Um, and they asked repeatedly why being arrested, why they're being arrested. An American has a right to know. Um, and he was denied that right. And of course, George Floyd himself was very much denied due process. Um, the Fifth Amendment says that no American shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without uh, due process from a jury of their peers. George Floyd was not given that opportunity because he was killed by this man. Um, and his Eighth Amendment right to not, let's say he even survived, by God. Um, well, this is uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Um, as is, you know, much, much of the stuff that we've seen police do. Um, we could we could put the and that's in the Eighth Amendment. We could we could have put that on some of these previous slides. And it's the case that when you when the press operates with the permission of the state, when you assemble only when the state gives you permission to do so, when your right to life comes from the permission of the state, it is not a right, right? When the state gets a choice as to whether they're going to break you up or arrest you because you're press, or shoot you because you're the press, or kill you, and there are no consequences for the actors in the state that did that, you do not have rights anymore. That kind of conversation can resonate with any American, um, even if they're looking back and saying, well, I don't know about systemic racism. So one option is you can skip that conversation entirely to get your fellow Americans on board. Another option, and you can do both of these, um, is to have a different kind of conversation about race. So I am so far from an expert about having good conversations on race, but we have had the honor twice of getting to interview Dr. David Camp. Um, uh, you can find him his work at whiteallytoolkit.com um, about how to have what, what I believe and Xander believes are better conversations about race that get people to open up more um, and change their perspectives about racism in America. Um, and that can be a way of building unity where the media and politicians are trying to drive further wedges between Americans. Um, and so real quick, how am I doing on time? Ooh, I'm taking a little long. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take this briefly and I apologize for taking so long. Um, but, but, you know, uh, from all the research that we've done, we see kind of four big root causes. There are others. One of them is qualified immunity, where the police, if they do something that you and I would otherwise get arrested for, um, they have a qualified immunity because they're basically their job is hard and it puts them on the front lines. Um, this is a state level thing. Of course, the police are militarized. Uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, police unions do a great job of protecting police from consequences. Um, 
And so you can imagine having a conversation with a, with a, a skeptical conservative about, hey, how do you feel about public unions? And they might go like, oh, you know, they, they do all this bad stuff, including, for example, um, let's say you get shot in the eyeball by the police and lose your eye, um, you know, shot with a rubber bullet, of course. Uh, and But if it's, if uh, with a lot of precincts, if your complaint is submitted too many days after an incident occurs, um, too bad, there will be no investigation, right? And there's, and, and, you know, and, and that may have been because you were in the hospital for two months. Um, it, it is rules like these that the, that these unions have negotiated that protect the police from consequences of criminal behavior. Um, and, uh, finally, of course, you know, private prisons, um, a, a lot of states actually have, uh, contracts with private prisons that have quotas for a minimum number of people in prison. Um, which means that of course, there's this perverse incentive for the state to look for more crimes and, and have more unnecessary police civilian interactions, which leads to options for more violence. Um, and so how can you actually take action? That's the part I promised. Um, you've got a lot of what I call coptions, right? What do you want to do about cops? Um, you can go after private prisons. I'm going to speed through this. Um, we could add more funding and have more training because most cops only get trained for six months and uh, don't know a whole lot about the law. Um, we could modify qualified immunity. We could try to end qualified immunity. We could actually reduce funding and defund, the, you know, it's also known as defunding the police and put a lot of that funding towards social work. We could re renegotiate the contract with the police union. If they don't want to do that, well, heck, we could just tear down the police force and replace it with a different one. Right, build it from the build it from up again, um, from the bottom again, and even some people are talking about abolishing the police and replacing it with something else, right? Which is pretty radical, um, uh, but some people are talking about it. And if you stand on the if you stand on the sidelines, well, someone else is going to set the agenda, right? And they're going to end up being the ones who push what they want, what their their favorite options um, through your locality. And when I say locality. If you want to make an impact, you need to go local. Those of you who know my work know that a big problem that we've had in this country is that Republicans, this is Congress, Republicans and Democrats used to be able to form these temporary coalitions to get stuff done. Now they don't. Um, they just vote by party lines now. Uh, the national level is, is not a great place to actually see progress in the United States in the last 20 years. But the good news is that most of these laws are state and local anyway. So um, you know, qualified immunity laws and private prison laws, they are, and, and contracts, they are state level. So talk to your state rep. And then at the local level, police rules of engagement, union contracts, and then their budget and their militarization are local. So you talk to your local reps who, by the way, you know, during this election, you know, during these presidential elections, they tend to be able to keep their heads down because everyone's worried about who's going to be president. They don't get a lot of flack. You can give them a lot of flack, right? And so what can you do about these? Well, first have those tough conversations and build a broad tent, right? Get a lot of people on board. Get 30 and 40 of your closest friends. Um, do your research together. Understand what's going on at the local and state level. What do the laws look like in where you live? Decide together on what you're gonna advocate for. Have a unified platform. Remember when I said, if you sit on the sidelines, someone else is gonna make the agenda, you can make the agenda. Um, and hit your local representatives as a united group. Email them, call them, and then take screenshots of that. Put it on social media. Get it for good use. It, the letter that you write, put it as a Google Doc. Um, let anyone copy, paste it, and spread it around and say, look, this is what we are demanding as the people who elect you. Um, and if you set the agenda, other people who want to do something but haven't done the work, they will follow your agenda and they will help you. Um, and then finally, of course, use the election as pressure. Go talk to whoever's running against them and say, hey, this is what, um, you know, this is what I'm hearing from my local representative. What are you going to do differently? Right. And get that pressure up to get them to take action, because ultimately, by golly, we're still in a democracy um, and you still have, uh, you know, you still have the final say. So um, that's uh, I'm a little late. That's my talk. We've got, I think, 15 minutes left. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam. But um, uh, let's take it away with questions. Fantastic talk. Um, now, obviously, I'm in the UK, so the uh, I'm not in I'm not in the states. But even so, that talk got me pumped to like I, I need. To, where's the revolution? Where are the barricades? I need to go do something. Um, but we just had a general election, and nothing's going to change for the next five years. So yay. Um, that was really, really interesting. I thought it was very interesting that um, the the fact that the extremes, I mean, it's, it's, it's surprising, but it probably shouldn't be, but that the extremes don't really 
look at the same news. I mean, that seems obvious now, but seeing it in statistical form is just like, well, that makes, that's obviously why people aren't, <laughs> if they're not getting the same information in the same way, then they're, they're going to come to vastly different uh, uh, decisions about it. Um, but I was also very interested that, um, and I've just lost it. Ah, I, had a, I had a question. It's gone now. Um, if you want to, if you want to uh, take a minute to recall yours, we've got a question from Michael here that I can that I can take, which is how, oh, yeah, much, so this, how much of this spike is an increase in violence uh, by police, and how much is an increase in visibility? I'm gonna. I'm. I. I hate to say I don't know the answer. Um, I have seen a few people try to grapple with that. Certainly, it's the case that we've we have protests that are wider in scope and uh, like larger in numbers of people than we have than we have seen since maybe the Rodney King riots of 1992. So violence against protesters in particular is, uh, yeah, <laughs> neither do I, um, thanks Michael. Um, uh, but so what that 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 breadth of protests, right? Obviously, it's very intimidating to the police, and we've seen how in many precincts. I, I think some precincts have actually responded quite well. Many precincts, from New York to Los Angeles to Chicago, right? Have there have been a lot of incidents of violence against that? So these are these are new situations that the police have had to deal with. Now, if we're talking about the day to day violence against people like um, George Floyd, um, and and of course countless others. Um, is is this a is this a spike in violence or a spike in visibility? The best estimates I've seen are that it's mostly just a spike in visibility. Now, there's been an upward trend of um, of violence if we look at the very long term, in large part due to the fact that the police are much more armed than they used to be. There are more police per capita than they used to be, um, and there are more police citizen reported police citizen interactions than there used to be. In particular, in large American cities. Um, which are you know, which tend to be much more um, which is which is where like uh, which uh, they have a higher portion of Black Americans than other parts of the country, um, and so those you know it, it is certainly the case that when you have more police civilian interactions, there's a higher likelihood that there's going to be um, uh, violence against those citizens. So um, I th my best guess is that there's a long term trend towards some increase. Um, in violence, but uh, the short-term spike that we're, but there's, sorry, but there's also been a dramatic increase in the amount of visibility. Um, we've seen, unfortunately, in a lot of these uh, previous cases, um, and I'm, I'm, forgetting the, I'm forgetting the specifics, but there are in a few podcasts that we did recently, um, that the police will falsify reports. Um, uh, and then, and one of the reasons we know that is that a report will be submitted and then some random civilians video of what actually happened surfaces and the police are like, oh yeah, we made a mistake when it's clearly just falsified. Um, and so part of the problem is that the old reporting may be, you know, may be unreliable, right? So, cause most of the reporting we have about what happened, right? Between the police and the civilian is what the police wrote down. Um, so that makes it impossible to truly say. Um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what I got. Visibility seems to be an important thing today. Yeah, I mean, it's actually one of the reasons we went for it because um, uh, I, I, I was like, oh, hidden voices, I want to do this. Um, Michael asked another question. How do you recommend I address these issues with police and COs in my family? COs being commanding officers, I assume. Um, I think with them, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I know, you know, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, I, I said it on show, like, I'm not a copist. I have cop friends. Um, obviously, I'm frustrated with the police right now, personally. And and in the show, I usually, like, what I like about these talks is I get to tell you my thoughts. Um, on the show, I kind of, we, we try to minimize that. But um, uh, but here's how I've talked to them, to them. I think, you know, there are a lot of good cops. And, and I know people say, like, well, if the good cops aren't reporting the bad cops, then they're bad cops, too. Part of the problem is that for the good cops... Um, there's a lot of incidents where the good cops report bad behavior and then they get fired, right? And not for that. Oh, it's for something else entirely, right? Um, some disciplinary. Oh, corrections officers. Cool. Thank you. Um, so these are the guys who work in jails. Um, and so I think we need to go into conversations with our friends who are who are in the police force with a lot of empathy and sympathy, right? Regardless of how we feel about the organizations as a whole, with each individual that we talk to, like unless we've seen evidence, it's like, oh my God, you shot this guy running away. Like, you probably just need to go to jail, buddy. Sorry. 
But like for your run of the mill, you know, beat cop, um, I think we need to go in with a lot of empathy and sympathy and ask a lot of questions. Hey, what do you think about, you know, you see like, I, I, you know, hey, I saw this video. What do you think about it? What do you think's going on? Can you explain to me why this happened? Right. And give them the initiative to 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 be an expert in the field, answering a question for you in a helpful way. Um, I think accusing them individually, like anyone's going to be defensive. Um uh, if you say like, hey, cop's bad, but like, hey, I want your perspective on this to help me better understand it. They're going to relish at that opportunity in part because they're probably getting a lot of flack right now. Um, and so I think the, and, and you know, those explanations, when they give you those explanations, it opens an opportunity for dialogue. Stick to questions and they can be challenging questions, right? You could say like, and and what I often like to do in those kinds of conversations is I'll use a straw man and know that it's, and identify that it's a straw man. Right. So I'll blame the straw man. So I'll say, you know, someone might say, right, someone who's, who's you know, who's, who's not as um, reasonable as I am, of course, might say that, um, you know, this cop, it was totally unnecessary for them to pull the trigger. Right. This guy was running away at this point. Right. That this is just like that, that, you know, that they're, that, that this is at least manslaughter. Right. And if I did it, I would, you know, and, and that's and it's through those straw men that you can introduce these challenges Right, you could because the cop will know, like, yeah, of course, someone is going to feel that way, you know, and and you can position yourself as someone who wants to understand them better and say, what about this less sympathetic perspective that someone else who is not me may have about this? How would you respond to that? Um, and I think those challenges can get them to dig a little bit deeper um, into, you know, in, into being willing to explain some of the challenges that individual police face in this system. Right, um, you know, systems make make people act a certain way. When you see everyone acting the same way, it's because of systemic incentives, right? Um, and so, and so, they're likely to be more willing to confess that, hey, in this system, if I like you, like the the you've hit gold when they say, like, if I speak up, I lose my job, and I've got to feed my family, right? So I don't, right? And it feels bad. Um, I've had that conversation, um, and and you realize, and and learning that from them. You start to realize that there are going to be there are going to be people. I I think there are going to be people in the police force that would welcome a new deal um, with other America, you know, with American citizens um, and with the cities that they that they're sworn to protect. Um, that creates more space for bad cops to face consequences. Okay, I mean, while we wait for um, another couple of questions. And this may be a bit too uh, fortune tellery, but um, what do you think is going to happen with all these? Everything's moving so quickly. You're the one who's seen the data. You're the one who have you've looked at the uh, st as the statistical opinions. What do you think is going to happen? Good question. I actually asked this of uh, Dr. Camp, um, who uh, who's the guy, the the man that we interviewed about um, about having better conversations about race. <laughs> Um, I actually, uh, and he said he, he, he kind of dodged the question and I, I will try to play a little bit of Nostradamus here. Um, I've, I studied the, the change in how Americans think about marijuana and gay rights pretty closely because I'm very interested in understanding what is the path for Americans to go from division to unity. Um, cause it sometimes happens, uh, not always, um, but sometimes Ooh, and we've got another question. So I'll keep this one, uh, um, I'll keep this one quick. Um, so what I think is likely to happen is that I think we're actually I think we're actually seeing a permanent change in attitudes. Uh, Mississippi is probably going to vote very soon to change its flag to get rid of the Confederate uh, stars and bars, actually naval stars and bars on it. Um, Mississippi, right? Like unbelievable. Um, so I think that you're going to see a few precincts lead the way. Minneapolis has been forced to be one of them. Um, you're going to see a few precincts lead the way in some fairly radical experiments with um, how the police, you know, the, the police relationship with the city and citizens. Um, and I think it's probably going to take five to 10 years. Um, you're going to see some national changes as well. Um, it's going to take five to 10 years. I forget which state, uh, I think, believe Colorado is actually planning to end qualified immunity, like entirely. Um, and you're going to see a lot of cops quit, right? They're going to feel under attack. They're just going to leave because they're like, I don't want to deal with this environment. 
Um, and so you're going to have this like kind of new generation of police um, entering the force as well. So I, I'm actually, I am very, very optimistic and very positive on this. Um, uh, more than I have been about kind of any issue since gay marriage circa 2006. Um, and that actually, you know, that took about nine years to go from, um, uh, to go, oh boy, we've got, okay, I'll, I'll shut up because we've got a couple questions. So um, Heather says. Oh, that, that wasn't meant as a shut up, I was just putting it there so you're aware that it was there. Yeah, no, continue, I, if you wish. I appreciate it. Um, Eric, I'm confused. This is just one example. In Sam Harris's show, he went through two hours last week. Uh, uh, going through stats that supposedly show police violence is way down in the past 20 years, also stats on race, etc. Uh, this goes to the idea that we can't agree on reality. It seems like no matter what you believe, you can find a statistic to back it up. How on earth can we come together as a country when there are literally alternative facts? Um, also, it seems like social media, especially Twitter, is kind of a shit show. Can we all just get off social media? Um, on the latter question, I uh, I agree with the state, of, the state of the problem, and I have no solution. On the former one, um, I may actually be, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I may be mistaken. Um, and I may be, uh, there, there, yeah, I may, I may be mistaken in where my trend line changes. Cause, cause one thing we do know is that in the past 20 years, actually the percentage of black Americans who are incarcerated has been steadily declining, which is actually great news. I think nobody knows about it. Um, which suggests that there are fewer arrests, right? More parole, all sorts of good stuff. Um, so this is our, unfortunately, our last minute. Um, uh, and, and I've got to answer this because I want everyone to be able to move on to Sam's show or Sam's uh, uh, talk, which is next. Um, but what do we do about alternative facts? Uh, ignore the facts. Don't worry about, so this, this is a great question. Don't worry about facts, right? No amount of facts got Americans fired up about police violence, um, no amount of facts got Americans fired up about Black Lives Matter. It was a man crying out for his mother as he was killed. Um, anecdotes win. Stories win. Individual stories win every time. Um, and that's the that's that's where you know, and and that could be used for ill, and it could use, be used for good. But we know through research, um, and and you know, and and we can look at these examples that that if you've got a good story. Um, you can change the world and, and most of them will fizzle, right? Most of them will not become viral, but in an individual conversation that you can have, these stories can change the world. Pictures can change the world. Video can change the world. A man's dying voice can change the world. Um, and you can do it one person at a time. So what a great way to end. Um, thank you, Heather. So, so leave the facts, facts backfire anyway. Um, there's plenty of research on that. Go for stories. Um, and and uh, and and I, I suggest in particular go check out David Camp's White Ally Toolkit because it uh, it's a his methodology applies to all sorts of issues not just um, not just race. Everyone, thank you so much. I'm Eric. I'm with Reconsider Media. You can go to reconsidermedia.com to check me out. I'm Eric E R I K at reconsidermedia.com. Um, uh, I'd love to hear more of your questions. We we like we we respond to everyone. Um, as much as, well, yeah, we respond to everyone. It may take time, but we respond to everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining, for your great questions. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, and I'd love to hear stories about how you have taken some of this forward, uh, taken action and, and made some change in your locality. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see, uh, I'll see you in the audience at the rest of the conference.